Are you hungry for the Word of God? Or do you desire to go deeper in your relationship with God? Calvary Chapel, Fergus Falls teaches verse by verse straight through the Bible on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. We meet at the YMCA at 1164 Freiburg Avenue. More information is available online at ccfergusfalls.com. Calvary Chapel, Fergus Falls, simply teaching the Bible simply. Well, with that, let's turn our Bibles to Genesis 22. We'll be picking up in verse 15, going through the end of chapter 23. So chapter and almost half is what we'll cover this morning. The title of our study is Trusting the Lord in Happy and Hard Times. And you'll see why I chose that title by, by we get to the end of our study today. Last time, it's been a little bit, but last time we studied the book of Genesis together, we saw uh, in chapter 22, Abraham and Isaac ascending Mount Moriah. God calling Abraham up this mountain to offer son Isaac on the altar there. And we saw the angel of the Lord intervene and told Abraham to stop. Don't do it. I know that now you trust me. You are going to offer your one and only son to me. And there... Nearby was a ram caught with his horns in the bramble bush, caught in the thicket. And we saw that a ram was a male lamb that specifically pointed us to Jesus, who John the Baptist declared, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we actually looked at that kind of as our Christmas message, um, because so much of this chapter pointed us to Jesus. This is one of the spots probably on the road to Emmaus that Jesus highlighted that this points to him. Same mountain range where he was going to be crucified, wood on the back, like Isaac had wood on the back. Both willingly, it was a three-day journey, uh, a fire and the knife, and there's so much correlation there. And so now we, we pick up with that story on the top of the mountain. We find God's blessing, Abraham, due to his faith. And so we pick up here in chapter 22, verse 15. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. We'll pause there. Imagine how happy Abraham was passing the test. (laughs) And there are times where we have a test from the Lord. And it's not for him to find out how we're going to do. It's really revealing to us how how we're doing. What's our character like? Are we, are we passing these tests the Lord gives us because we're, we're walking with them uprightly? Or is it an opportunity where we realize, okay, Lord, I failed, but you're going to forgive me and help me the next time. And um, it reminds me that Abraham had this faith and this trust in the Lord. In the book of Hebrews, we commonly call this the hall of faith. And in verse 6, it says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. It's a fascinating verse because it doesn't say that without faith, it's difficult to please God. It says it's impossible to please God. And there are times in our life where we think that we can do things without faith. (laughs) Uh, And Jesus reminds us in John chapter 15 that apart from him, we can do nothing. Nothing eternal, nothing lasting. So we need to continue to have this faith and this trust in the Lord. And there's no way around it. God simply will take no pleasure in our accomplishments, no matter how great they may be, apart from faith in Him. I've learned that the Bible says that without faith, we will not be successful. Without trusting in the Lord, we will not be successful. We have to look to the Lord and trust in Him to be successful. And the rest of the verse in Hebrews 11 says that, that we have faith that's acceptable to God. Um, that our faith is pleasing to Him. And that He's a rewarder of those that, that have this faith in Him. 
And so there's two things that we must believe in the Lord. One is that he exists. And the second is that he rewards people who desire to trust and walk with him. And so this is really sweet success, knowing that God is our rewarder simply because we're trusting in him, simply because we love him and we rely upon him. And I think sometimes that can be hard for us um, to receive God's grace, to accept that God wants to reward us for simply trusting in him, but he does. God wants to reward us for simply trusting in him. And that's the mercy and the love and the grace of our Lord. Not only did he save us, but he wants to reward us. Um, I mean, that's so foreign from our mind. You know, that's like somebody going out and you see someone drowning in the lake and you go rescue them and you get them up on shore and then you go take care of them and reward them with a house and a car and all this stuff. That's what the Lord does for us. He lavishes his love upon us. And and that sweet success is knowing the Lord and walking with him. Later on in the book of Hebrews 11, we're told that Abraham's faith, uh, that he knew God was able to raise the dead, able to keep his promises. And we're told in the Bible that Abraham believed the Lord and God counted to him for righteousness. And that word righteousness means he had a right standing with God. It wasn't based upon his works, wasn't based upon what he deserved or anything he could earn, it was based upon faith, based upon trust in the Lord. And the same is true with us. Our righteousness, our right standing with God is based upon our faith, our trust in him. We can't earn it. We don't deserve it. Um, There's nothing we can do to obtain it except trust in Christ. It's a free gift of salvation. It's a free gift that God has for us. We simply have to receive it and utilize it in our lives. And so God desires us to be righteous. And just as Abraham believed God, it was kind of as righteous. So we are today who believe in God's son, Jesus Christ. It's in Christ Jesus that we have righteousness. In fact, the scriptures say that we're clothed in his righteousness. We're righteous because of Christ Jesus living in us and with us. And so we also have this right standing. But we need, to, we need to do a couple of things. And we need to first believe that God is real. And then again, we have to believe he wants to reward us for trusting in him. And, and that's again the love and the grace of God. He's a giver and a rewarder. Well, we also see here uh, in verse 15 mentioned is the angel of the Lord. And this is something that is unique. Uh, The precise identity of the angel of the Lord is not given in the scriptures. However, there are important clues to his identity. In the Old and in the New Testament, there's references to angels of the Lord, an angel of the Lord, and the angel of the Lord. And each of those are different. Uh, It seems when the definite article the is used, It specified a unique being separate from all the other angels. Most theologians believe the angel of the Lord speaks of the pre-incarnate Christ. And what that means is the angel of the Lord were manifestations of Jesus before he was born of Mary. In fact, Jesus declared in John 8, 58 to the religious leaders, he said, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And then he also told them that Abraham rejoiced to see his day and was glad. So, whatever the case, whether the angel of the Lord is the pre-incarnate appearance of Christ, also known as a Christophany, it was highly likely it was an appearance of God himself. So, God shows up here in talking to Abraham. But also notice what the angel of the Lord says. He says that this was the only son of Abraham. Again, we know (laughs) Abraham had another son named Ishmael through Hagar, the maidservant of Sarah. And we know that Abraham um, had this son through his fleshly attempt to fulfill God's promise. But God did not recognize this other son. So Isaac could be called his only begotten son. And again, we saw in our study of Last time in chapter 22, 
that, that points us to Jesus, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, right? John 3.16, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So we see the correlation pointing us to Jesus. And God also says that He'll bless Abraham to have descendants as numerous as the stars of heaven or the sand on the seashore. Have you ever tried to look outside and count the stars? Or you go to the beach and you count the grains of sand? It's really difficult. You'll lose track. It's it's impossible. Scientists have done their best to guess, and I, I think it was like 10 to the power of 25, which is ridiculous, hard for a mind to even comprehend. Um, but it, it's, it's showing this point that it's going to be so numerous, very difficult to count. It's God's way of saying, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to bless you more than you could ever think or imagine. And, uh, and that's awesome that he wants to do this to Abraham. Uh, but one last thing before we move on. Notice here in verse 18, he says to Abraham, In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed me. Notice it's that through Abraham, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Again, at this point, Abraham only has one son, legitimate, of the promise, his only begotten, Isaac, the son of laughter, <laughs> his name meaning laughter. And that's it. He doesn't have other children, no grandchildren yet. And yet, he knows that through him, all the nations of the earth will be blessed, not just his nation. This is a prophetic passage point us to Jesus, that through Jesus, we're blessed with forgiveness of our sins and entrance into heaven to be with Jesus forever. It's through the Messiah that was promised to come, through Jesus, that all the nations are blessed. And so it's through our Messiah, through our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, that we are blessed as well. So this is pointing us to Jesus. And again, I'm sure this is one of the spots Jesus would have pointed out on the road to Emmaus uh, to the two disciples. Well, in verse 19 through 24, we'll see they come down the mountain. Uh, Verse 19, so Abraham returned to his young men, and they rose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. Now it came to pass after these things that it was told Abraham, saying, Indeed, Milcah also has born children to your brother Nahor, Huz his firstborn, Buzz his brother, uh, Camuel the father of Aram, Chizad, Hazo, Pildash, Jelalapa and Bethuel, and Bethuel begot Rebekah. These eight Milcah bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother. His concubine, whose name was Remua, also bore Teba, Gaham, Terhash, and Makira. I'm sure I mispronounced some of those names. Um, it's interesting, his firstborn uh, is Huz, and his brother's Buzz. Huz and Buzz. Some interesting names to to name your kids. Um, But in this short section, we see Abraham came back down the mountain. And he fulfilled this promise to his servants. Remember, he said, the lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will return to you. That promise is now fulfilled. They have come back down the mountain and returned to the servants. Again, um, we see after this encounter with the Lord, they then go back to Beersheba, where everyone else is. And it just reminds me, there's something sweet about looking back at the Lord's faithfulness. His faithfulness to keep His promises. There are times we are prone to be so forgetful. We forget the ways the Lord has intervened in our life. The prayers that He has answered. The ways He has shown His faithfulness towards us. It's one of the reasons I suggest keeping a prayer journal. Write down the things the Lord has done in your life. Write down the things... That God has answered in your life. Uh, because we are so easy to forget those things. Um, and, and we want to remember the goodness of the Lord in our lives. We don't want to forget. Uh, and in fact, this is one of the reasons I think King David often wrote these songs. Was to remind himself and others of God's faithfulness. In fact, there's a whole psalm 
there's a stanza in there that repeats over and over again about the love of God. His mercy endures forever. His mercy endures forever. And we need to be reminded of those promises. Uh, I don't think you can ever remind me too much that God loves me. You can't. <laughs> I need that reminder all the time. And so we want to remember the promises of the Lord and his faithfulness to keep his promises. Now, one of the other names in this section here, the family of Nahor, who's the brother of Abraham, is Rebekah. And we'll see so much more why this is important in chapter 24 when we get there. Um, because Abraham wants there to be a bride for his son Isaac. And we'll see how God used a servant and his prayer to confirm that Rebekah would be the one. I could probably spend a whole hour on that, but we'll wait till we get to chapter 24. So I'll spare you that um, till we get there. <laughs> um, but we'll get there in a few weeks and we'll take a look at that. How Rebekah... Uh, is brought to Isaac and how the Lord's hand is over all this and this relationship. Well, next in chapter 23, um, give you a spoiler alert. We're going to find out that Abraham's wife, Sarah, passes away. And we're going to look at how he responds to that. So let's take a look at the first couple of verses here in Genesis chapter 23. Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. So Sarah died in Kirjath Irba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. We'll pause there. Now for you Bible students, it's interesting that Sarah is the only woman in the Bible whose age at death is recorded. And I thought, that's interesting. It gives us, I think, some insight and measure of how highly regarded she is in the Bible. And interestingly, twice we were told to look to Sarah as an example, both in Isaiah 51 and 1 Peter 3. So Sarah is a good example to follow. Um, she was fully submitted to God with a gentle and quiet spirit, and not only was she in submission to the Lord, but she had this beautiful relationship of trust with her husband, Abraham. And it reminds me, no human family is perfect, because we know, as we've read through, there were some times where things didn't always work out between Abraham and Sarah. Um, but we also know that we can be perfect in the perfect family of God. God accepts us. And because he is perfect, he is working to perfect us. So Sarah is this great example. And again, Isaiah 51 and 1 Peter 3 remind us of that. Now we also see here that Abraham mourns for the loss of his wife. Death of a family member or a friend is always difficult. And it's perfectly normal and okay emotion to mourn, to weep to cry, to be broken over the death of a loved one. In fact, there's something wrong with you if that doesn't occur. Um, and you can seek medical help, <laughs> and there are those that can help with that. Um, but God's given us this human response to weep to these things. Um, and it's a perfectly natural and good human emotion. For example, one of the shortest and yet powerful verses simply tells us that Jesus wept. That's found in John chapter 11, verse 35, Jesus wept. And if you've ever done a Bible quiz, people will ask you, hey, can you name a Bible verse? Jesus wept. John eleven thirty-five. 35. Score. I got a Bible verse done. Memorized. But it's so deep and yet powerful because God Almighty became our Emmanuel, one of us, was so broken over the death of his friend Lazarus that he wept. God weeps. God knows our brokenness. God knows our grief. And he identifies with that. And so it's okay to weep over death. And it reminds us this is why Jesus came to put it into death and defeat our greatest enemy. The good news is Jesus brought Lazarus back from the dead. And in doing so, he showed he alone has the power to give life. And then Jesus went to the cross. He suffered 
and died on the cross for our sins. He took the judgment that we deserve, the penalty that we rightly deserve upon himself. And then gives us what he had, which is righteousness, relationship with the Father, peace and forgiveness that we're offered now because he's holy and he's pure. But more than that, he rose from the dead. And not only do we have life, we have life eternal, forgiveness forever in Jesus Christ. And so he alone provides us with eternal life. So we grieve, yes, but not as those without hope. Jesus is our hope. Jesus promised that he will make all things new. And we can trust that he will. So we look to the Lord in our times of grief. We trust in the Lord in those hard times as well. And not only did Abraham feel the loss of his wife, Sarah, deeply, but we'll see next he wasn't afraid to take care of her burial arrangements, which was a way to honor her life and a way to remember her by as well. So verse 3 through 9, we read, Then Abraham stood up from before his dead and spoke to the sons of Heth, saying, I am a foreigner and a visitor among you. Give me property for a burial place of money that I may bury my dead out of my sight. And the sons of Heth answered Abraham, saying, Hear us, my lord. You are a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our burial places. None of us will withhold from you his burial place that you may bury your dead. Then Abraham stood up and bowed himself to the people of the land, the sons of Heth. And he spoke with them, saying, If it is your wish that I bury my dead out of my sight, hear me, and meet with Ephron, the son of uh, Zohar, for me, that he may give me the cave of Machpelia, which he has, which is at the end of his field. Let him give it to me at the full price as property for a burial place among you." I'll pause there for just a moment. We see Abraham speaks with the sons of Heth. And he saw himself as a foreigner or a sojourner. And I think not only because he was from Ur of the Chaldeans, but I think he also saw himself, uh, in light of his wife passing, as a pilgrim passing through. That his real home was in heaven. In fact, if you read Hebrews 11, it talks about this, that he... He, he looked for the city above. He was fixed. His, his gaze was fixed on heaven. He had a longing to be with the Lord in heaven. It's a reminder to me that we are simply pilgrims passing through this planet on planet Earth. We're, we're not going to be here forever. This is our temporary place. We're going to go and upgrade to a mansion someday. <laughs> and, and so we can look forward to that. We're going to be with our Lord forever and ever and paradise. Um, there's nothing better than that. And so that's the real home that we have is heaven. And, and, and so Abraham had this in mind. And he also had this particular property in mind, the cave of Machpelah. This property was in the land of Ephron, the son of Zohar. Most likely, uh, Abraham had already had this conversation with him. Hey, you've got this cave I have this on your land. I'd like to buy it. And he had to go to the city elders uh, to make this transaction public and legally binding. And we'll see next uh, how this occurs in the culture here in verse uh, 10 all the way through verse 16. Now Ephron dwelt among the sons of Heth. And Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the presence of the sons of Heth, all who entered at the gate of his city, saying, No, my Lord, hear me. I give you the field and the cave that is in it. I give it to you in the presence of the sons of my people. I give it to you. Bury your dead. Then Abraham bowed himself down before the people of the land. And he spoke to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, saying, If you will give it, please hear me. I will give you money for the field. Take it from me, and I will bury my dead. And Ephron answered Abraham, saying, My Lord, listen to me. The land is worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? So, there you're dead. And Abraham listened to Ephron. And Abraham weighed out the silver for Ephron, which he had named in the hearing of the sons of Heth. 400 shekels of silver, currency of the merchants. We'll pause there. 
The way of negotiating a price, uh, typical of the ancient and modern practices in that culture, was to have this gesture of kindness to begin this discussion, this negotiation between the two parties. And in selling, they would offer an item uh, to the buyer until the buyer insists on paying a price. And we see that's what's occurring here is, is, well, you take the field. No, no, I can't take the field. I'm going to offer you a price. Oh, okay, well, let's go 400 shekels of silver. And so Ephron the Hittite followed the culture customs of bargaining. First, as a seller, he offered to give this property, this item. And then he was supposed to be waiting for the rebuttal, the counter offer. Well, you know, 400 is a lot. Let's settle down to 200. Oh, no, 200 is too little. Let's go 300, right? Kind of this back and forth. That was to be expected. The price was typically and almost always refused so that another price could be suggested. But Abraham doesn't do that. Instead, he accepts the full price or this highest price, this higher price, and that's the end of the negotiation. <laughs> I think he's, he's, I don't care. I'll pay with the price that you want. I'm not going to negotiate down. 400? Here you go. <laughs> 400. And I don't think they were expecting that. But I think he was wanting to bless them as well for this land. And um, it's interesting because we don't really do this much in our country. We, we don't really bargain for a price in our country. Um, we don't really do that much here. Unless you're paying for it in cash maybe at a yard sale or something like that. Or maybe making a large purchase like purchasing a home. There's usually a little back and forth for the negotiating the purchase price. Well, we'll do this if you do the closing cost. Well, you know, we're going to come back a little bit. Um, that's as, probably as much bargaining as we do, uh, the bartering aspect of it. Now, if you come with us to Israel, you'll find this cultural custom is still valid. In fact, there are some of the merchants that will be insulted if you don't try and barter with them, which is foreign to us. Stick a price as this is 10 shekels. Here's 10 shekels. Oh, no, no. You know, I'll give you five shekels. Oh, nine shekels. No, six shekels. Seven shekels. Deal. Okay, here's your seven shekels. And it's kind of this, this opportunity to mingle for them. And if they don't get the first sale to be like that, they kind of feel like the rest of the day is not going to go well. So it's very interesting. And that culture, that's still the custom. Again, we don't do that. You can't go into Walmart, grab something, and say, oh, I'm not going to pay a full price for this. I'll... I'll make you a deal. <laughs> doesn't really happen in our culture, but outside of America, it's very common. And so we see that that's the typical uh, uh, bargaining that takes place in the marketplace. Um, but again, Abraham ended the negotiation and just went for the full price. And not only did he want to bless them, but he says it also, also here that he bowed before them, the people of the land. And, and so doing... I think Abraham showed how a follower of God should conduct business in the world. To be kind, to be fair, and to be trustworthy. I remember when I was working with the college ministry, which I'll actually be starting back up this next Wednesday, um, out at M State, Fergus Falls, helping again this semester. Um, one of the guys who was working at, at a restaurant in town told me that uh, Sundays were the worst. And I said, what do you mean? Isn't that the busiest day? He said, yes, but there are those who come from church service who are Christians, and sometimes they are the rudest customers, and they don't tip. <laughs> they leave a mess. And uh, I thought, man, what a bad witness for Christ. Um, so they get your meal wrong. So it's not exactly what you ordered. So, you know, this, this, and that. They forgot to give you a napkin or a straw. Be kind, <laughs> be polite, be respectful, um, be trustworthy, um, you know, be fair. And we're trying to win people to Christ. <laughs> we want to be a good witness. Uh, in fact, there's been times I've ordered something and they give me something else. And it's like, did I order that? And I'm thinking, well, if they don't come back in a couple minutes and say, hey, we gave you the wrong plate, then I'm going to eat it. I'm not going to send it back. I don't want to be rude. And then you find out, hey, I actually like this. This is pretty good. <laughs> I would have ordered it on my own. Um, but we want to be respectful, right? We want to win people to Christ. And, and there is a time and a place to say, hey, look, I'm allergic to something, or this isn't what I ordered exactly. But do it in a manner that's kind and respectful. 
Um, because the last thing you want to do is see that person next Sunday, and they get the Sunday off and come to your church service, and they see you, and they walk right out. <laughs> Wouldn't be very good, right? So we want to follow Abraham's example here, right? We want to have the spirit of Christianity to be kind, to be fair, and to be trustworthy, right? We want to represent the Lord rightly. Well, in this last section, we'll see the land is transferred to Abraham and what that implies in verse 17 through verse 20. So the field of Ephron, which was in Machpelah, which was before Mamre, the field and the cave which was in it, all the trees that were in the field, which were within all the surrounding borders, were deeded to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the sons of Heth, before all who went in at the gate of the city, of his city. And after this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah, before Mamre, that is Hebron, and the land of Canaan. So the field and the cave that is in it were deeded to Abraham by the sons of Heth as property for a burial place. So in this last section, as we conclude, we see that if this was the only piece of land Abraham ever obtained in the promised land, he did so by faith. He buried his wife there, knowing that someday he would be buried there, which he was. And later on, uh, others would be buried there. Uh, Isaac and Rebekah would be. Uh, Jacob and Leah would be. Um, and so it's fascinating that by faith, he knew that this was the land God had promised him. And it shows he was a real man of faith. But also it shows the land forever belongs to the descendants of Abraham. There's a lot of debate today who owns this land. The Bible records to us Abraham purchased this section of the land. It was deeded to him and his descendants forever. Again, Ishmael is already off at a different place at this point. This land goes to Abraham and to his son Isaac and his descendants. So it shows us even to this day, Israel has a right to exist and a right to be in this land that not only God has given to them, but that Abraham has purchased. It stays within this family. So the land that is there today belongs to the nation of Israel. And not only that, but we see that Abraham had faith. And I think we need to have the same faith that Abraham had to believe that God can take care of us. Not only in the happy times, but also in the hard times. God can take care of us. We can turn to him and we can trust in him that he loves us and he's going to help us and be with us in those times of difficulty. So we need to know that God exists. Know that he loves us and know that he will reward us when we trust in him. Again, true success is knowing God and walking with him. That's sweet success. Faith in the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to look at your word and allow your word to get into us this morning. Father, I thank you personally for the dear people who are present here. What a privilege and a joy it is, Lord. Um, to, to teach them your word and to, to feed them uh, the scriptures. I ask, Lord, that you'd bless each and every person here. And, Lord, help us to trust in you completely. Fully surrender everything into your hands, into your control. Jesus, we thank you for calling us to this church and to this ministry. We ask that you'd help us to keep our eyes upon you. And, Lord, we pray if there be those listening to this message later on, uh, perhaps here this morning, who need to surrender their life to you, that by your Spirit you convict them of their sin and convince them of your amazing love. If that's you, and you'd say, Pastor Tim, pray for me, pray with me. I need to get right with the Lord. I simply want to lead you in a prayer where you make that decision to believe that Jesus loves you, died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose from the dead. And if you're ready to do that this morning, I simply want to lead you in a prayer where you make that decision. So I encourage you to repeat this prayer after me and mean it in your heart. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I realize that my sin separates me from you. 
God, I realize that you love me. That you sent your son Jesus to suffer and die on the cross for my sins. That he was buried and rose from the dead. God, I ask that you'd forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and my life today. Be my Savior, my Lord, and my friend. Jesus, I thank you for loving me. I thank you for forgiving me. Help me to walk with you from this day forward. I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You've been listening to a message from Calvary Chapel in Fergus Falls, Minnesota. With Pastor Tim Olzer. Enjoy this message? Please help us change lives by giving at ccfergusfalls.com slash giving. Again, our website is ccfergusfalls.com and you can give at ccfergusfalls.com slash giving. Thank you. And may God bless you as you continue to study His Word with us, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book.